Thank you. So wonderful to have you with me. I hope that you had a beautiful weekend. If you're joining me on replay, welcome to the show. We're live today. I'm excited to welcome you to today's live Level Up Conversation. Welcome to Level Up with Winnie Sun. Hello, friends. I'm Winnie Sun, your host, Forbes contributor, CNBC council member, and award winning financial pro here to keep you on top of relevant trending business news. But most importantly, you know, what makes this show special is that you're joining me live and you're part of today's discussion. We're going to be sharing audience feedback throughout the show. It is so great to have you with us. And of course, welcome back. Today is so special. I can't wait to introduce you to a very special friend. As a reminder, this month, though, uh, he and I are going to be celebrating with you. It is Asian Apparent Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, which is very, very special. But I have a powerhouse guest with us today. He's popular, of course, in K-pop circles, but also more importantly, he's an established entrepreneur and really business mar business powerhouse, CMO, marketing mind of Airdeck, board member of Dollar Four. Wants so much, so many that there's so much that we have to talk about. And actually, I think you're gonna find his story not only inspiring but also something uh, really, really hopeful for you and your own business journey. So we're in for a treat. But before we jump to him, and I know you want to meet him, here's how the market closed. We got to get through the tough part before we get the fun part, right? So first off, I want to say hello to, oh, so many guests. Thank you so much for so many friends joining me today. It is great to have you back with me on this beautiful Monday. But let's talk about how the market closed. I wish I had better news for you, but unfortunately, you know, there are, there's going to be days like this. You know, there's a song that says there's days like this. Unfortunately, there are days like this. The Dow closed down 653 points. NASDAQ also down 521 points. And the S&P 500 also down 132 points. So a triple down day. Fortunately, we were hoping for a better week this week, and it doesn't look like um, we're getting it. Unfortunately, the infl inflation outlook for consumers cons cons continues to be really, really difficult. In fact, the Fed survey just released today. My friends at CNBC shared an article talking about, um, you know, unfortunately, inflation continue to be a grave concern for consumers um, nationwide. In addition, we continue to see weakness now on international markets. In fact, Japan's um, market definitely down more than 2%. Uh, China's April trade data also came in, unfortunately, uh, very, very challenging as well. So we continue to see Asians, the Asian stock market continue to tumble and have challenges, just like we have here in the United States. Now, part of the reason is, is also because you may have seen some of the news this weekend, but namely today, unfortunately, uh, COVID, continues to be creating considerable havoc here in the United States. In fact, the White House came out today asking, of course, Congress for more money in the name in the amount of 22.5 billion big ones. They're looking for additional funding. In fact, the nation is saying, look it, we need to do something about this. We need to continue to have money for testing and vaccines and prevention and all these things. And if we don't have enough money, they're saying that the next generation of vaccines, well, they might not be able to offer it to all of us. In fact, they might only have enough budget for those select few, which, you know, is always a little concerning. But that's the news that's coming out. And they're saying that the Biden administration is adding that. Um, unfortunately, it looks like based on numbers and studies that are showing that we could have over 100 million Americans um, contracting COVID-19, maybe the new subvariant, whatever it may be at that time, again this fall. So unfortunately, not such great news coming out of uh, business news today, but I thought I would keep you on top of this because with this knowledge helps us better navigate our future business decisions for each of us, right? Now, today is a very special treat. As I hinted earlier in the show, let's have some fun, right? Let's welcome my friend, Jack Fon. He's an entrepreneur, CMO of Airdeck, board member of Dollar Four once, and he's just a, like a really, really cool dude. Jack, welcome to the show. How are you? Doing great, Winnie. Thank you so much for having me again. 
Well, it is such a treat to have you with us. Let me just tell you, uh, you know, I've had a chance to now um, know you for a little bit now. I know we first started as Adobe Insiders, and but you know, you are actually really, really well known in the social media space. But not only that is as a very, I would definitely say a serial entrepreneur, right? 20 plus years building, scaling startups. You're currently chief marketing officer of AirDeck, uh, which is a leader in on-demand document narration and tracking. And that's, I want to talk about so many other things that you've done in the past as well. And I know you continue to help uh, many, many media powerhouses. But can we also say, Jack, you have a lot of Twitter followers. I think that's something that is really, really impressive because for those of you who know, you know, in the past, of course, it probably was a lot easier to gain traction on uh, Twitter. But Twitter and a lot of social media platforms have done a great job of um, cleaning house consistently and periodically to make sure that the followers that you have are real and authentic and truly engaged. And I got to say, Jack, your Twitter follower, over a million followers, million plus, um, are highly engaged. And they almost, I feel like, Jack, you could actually take pictures of pebbles and it would do well. <laughs> I wish I had that kind of power. Um, but yeah, no, I think, you know, over the years, I've just found out that if you build a good relationship with um, your audience, right, have conversations, let them know that you're listening and reply, it, it, it builds a great connection. And that, can communication uh, allows you to a uh, connection allows you to have better communication and and so when I'm sharing things it's really authentic and, and it's fun and um, you know it's still inspiring for those who, who are looking for motivation and whatnot but also I like to have fun out there and and uh, I'm myself so who knew right just a, a regular business guy who decided he wanted to talk to a bunch of people um, share fun things and uh, can build an audience the way I have so it's been really great. Well, congratulations, Jack. It's an impressive audience. And we're definitely going to talk more about that. I, I want to say, you know, I feel like, you know, when we talk about Twitter, we know about Jack. But let me just tell you, I'm thinking that Jack follows our Jack today. So really, really <laughs> fun. Like when we're talking about Jack Dorsey, of course, for fun. But let's talk about this, Jack. I really want to talk to you about your backstory. You know, I know you and I have known each other for a bit. I've always um, had an interest. I know you told me a little bit about that. I think it's fascinating. If you don't mind, if you could share with our audience today, how it all started, how, you know, where was the back, where did you learn and where did you grow up and kind of give us the backstory there? Yeah. So, I mean, <clears throat> I love telling the story. I go back, you know, from when my, my father uh, was in Vietnam and, and, you know, the end of the, uh, the war there. So, um, you know, my family left on a refugee boat uh, from Vietnam and uh, we were actually uh, attacked by pirates and, and robbed twice. Um, and then at one point I became an abduct abductee of, of the pirates and uh, uh, luckily reunited with my family and, and made it to the U.S. Um, when I was on, on my first birthday, actually. So that was really uh, an important moment um, for me to be able to, and, and our family, to come to this um new land and without really knowing any English or anything like that and creating a new um, space for our lives. And my father um, passed away uh, earlier uh, or early last year. He made it to 90 years old. Um, you know, he built a great family for all of us, uh, an opportunity for all of us to to grow within the, the U.S. And, and, and make a name for ourselves and the things that we do and, and how we help out people. Um, so with that, you know, he was always inspiring me to create things, to look at things in a different lens as well as just be entrepreneurial, right? Don't put your um, reliance on other people, the government or anything like that. Um, you know, I, there's handouts, food stamps, all those fun things, but he always encouraged me. You've got to make what you can do. You go out and, and, and encourage us. He encouraged us to be the best versions of ourselves uh, and showed us the path to do that. So uh, I became an entrepreneur, um, you know, really, really early on. I think I spent a year in China studying abroad in college, came back to the U.S. Um, right when the dot-com uh, in 1996 was beginning, right, 95, 96. You know, you had the yahoos of the world and stuff like that beginning to, to pop up. Um, but, you know, one of the things I've always done growing up was I look at things um, from a different lens. And I look at opportunities of finding new ways to do old things right and uh, one of my first startups was that basically taking yellow page books uh, and turning them uh, into new ways of uh, getting leads to contractors so we raised 26 million dollars on that first uh, business grew it dot-com bubble bursted we ended up selling that company to what today is known as uh, 
home advisor and Angie's list. So that was a great exit and start to my career, which gave me a taste of uh, what it felt like to to build something really meaningful. And from there, I went on to build a second business, sold that business uh, in, in a very uh, successful way as well, bootstrapped that business with my co-founder, Eric Dubley. And um, from there, I went on and invested in a bunch of different companies. But then I, I joined um, Digital Trends, another company in the tech media space, and started to look at uh, expanding opportunities as far as how companies grow, affiliate marketing, uh, digital marketing, content marketing, a lot of marketing focus. Even though I was really mm -hmm. more of a technology guy, um, I was able to really transform what I'd learned in the past and took it to more of a marketing focus. And, and, and social media, what I was really blooming at that time, allowed me to really take advantage of those opportunities. So uh, from there, I've gone on to build my own agency to help other publishers uh, in the news space. And then uh, a couple of businesses here and there. I'm now I'm currently the um, chief marketing officer at Airdeck and kind of helping uh, us grow our our brand and our audience and our inbound uh, leads here as well. Really introducing um, the entrepreneurs there at Airdeck on how to scale this business as well. So that's impressive, Jack. Can we talk about that? I think you made a really good point. You know, you said, "Well, I've been in technology, but I've also." realize and recognize uh, my role in marketing as well. You know, sometimes, I think a lot of times when we we try to find our way, right, our, our, our role, like what, what work we should be doing, we sort of don't feel like, you know, technology and marketing maybe go hand in hand. What would you say to that when you say, well, I feel like I'm much more of a technical person, but I feel like I need to learn social media as well? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, when I started my career, I started as a telemarketing, to be honest, honest with you. So I started telemarketing on the first company, you know, calling homeowners, asking if they needed to have, um, you know, remodel their house or new windows replaced or whatnot. But I'm always learning, right? I'm always looking at how people respond to me and looking at ways to improve that. Uh, over time, my, at that time, I looked at it and said, I can improve this with technology. I built a database, I built a website, I built technology that helped made that process a little bit easier, a little bit smoother, um, and more uh, you know, less with less restrictions and allowing that to grow. But you are you're always learning, I'm always learning. And I'm always trying to understand, you know, how are people reacting to what I have to say? How are people responding to um, doing things automated versus um, manual, right? And how do, are people at understanding and accepting new technologies or new processes? Um, in regards to how they're used to things, right? And does it make it easier? Does it make it faster? Does it make it better? Uh, and so all these things, you know, coming from with the technology background, you know, looking at that from a marketing perspective, once you're able to identify that with the, you know, businesses or consumers, you know, what are they looking for? What, what are the pain points that we're solving for them? Uh, and how do, you know, we, we talk about that and, and build relationships with them so they build that trust. That's when you, know, you start picking up new skills. And so for me, I'm, I'm always learning new skills. I went, you know, built technology, now I'm in marketing, uh, but I'm an entrepreneur. I, I fit wherever it's needed uh, and I'll find ways to make it work. I learn very, very fast. And, and that's how I'm able to continue to progress in, in my career. I love what you said, Jack. You said, I, I find a need and I just, I learn and I, I learn really fast and I move. And I love how you say you can just pivot, right? You didn't have to stick into one sort of shell. Like you didn't have to have one definition. I can think of Jack. When I think of you, Jack, I think of someone who is really talented in so many different avenues and different spaces. And that's what I think is very inspiring when you learn about your story, Jack. And especially, I mean, you know, I'm sure many of you caught that when Jack talked about, he was actually, you know, captured by pirates. I don't think many of us can talk <laughs> about that, Jack. Have you actually met anyone who's who can say the same that they've been captured by pirates? No, uh, honestly, I cannot. And it's, it is one of those things where uh, I told the story way back when to, you know, an old uh, colleague of mine, he was in marketing. He's like, that's a story, Jack. You got to take that and, and uh, <laughs> you know, share with people that story. But it is a really incredible journey to to think about you know, how my life started. Right. Uh, I was born on an island just south of Vietnam that was, you know, basically there's like no nobody there. It's now a resort place um, down in, in, in Vietnam. But there was nobody there at that time. And when we left that, uh, you know, the, the Vietnam, um, you know, I was born in no hospital. My, my dad actually buried my placenta and my uh, umbilical wow. cord in the sand there, which I need to go back and I want to, you know, step on the land where I was born, right? Mm -hmm. um, and to go from there to being robbed and kidnapped and 
um, you know, making it all the way to where I am today and, and having the career I have, it, it's really an incredible story that I, I hope one day I'll be able to share in a memoir or uh, some type of book um, that I'm working on right now as well. So, um, and share that with the world. Yeah, that's incredible, Jack. I, I'm curious. Um, so your parents went through this, um, like how, do, how do you think, I'm just guessing right now, right? How did this impact them? Did they tell you, um, going through this, did, did it made, I'm, I'm guessing it actually made them much more resilient. Absolutely. No, you know, my father, um, and I'm hearing more and more stories every day about my father from my brothers who, you know, we reunited after my father passed away. Uh, and we've just been telling stories. Um, and and mm -hmm. I lived with my father when he, you know, when we came to the U.S. And my brothers um, and sisters lived with him mostly when they were in Vietnam. So there was, it's a big difference, right? And so my, my siblings are now over in the U.S., but we're connecting and we're sharing stories of when he, when my brother was you know, 17 years old versus when I was 17 years old with my dad, two completely different dads, but um, he's changed so much over the years and, and always figured out what he needed to do. You know, he was, a, a, he was in the army um, in Vietnam, actually led uh, several of the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, what do you call that? The, the armies down in, in the, during the war in, in Vietnam. And so he was, you know, really high ranking official um, in, in those places. Mm -hmm. To go from that to being a carpenter and then hiding in the jungles in the south of Vietnam to coming to America. And then he became an entrepreneur. And like most Vietnamese refugees, you had to find different ways to, to um, build a career. Interestingly enough, my father created a, a career out of upholstery, right? Which wow. is recovering sofas and chairs. And he, uh, you know, to pay thousand five thousand dollars, got a got, got learned how to do that. Went out and, and opened up his own upholstery shop in a basement of our house, right? Mm -hmm. And so that to me, he always found ways. Like you know, I could take these handouts from from uh, the state or from the government food stamps, um, you know, but there were restrictions on on what I could do, how much I could earn, all these things. And he's like, I, I didn't want that. Uh, he said, he said, he told me as I grew up, he's like, don't rely on other people to um, you know, to, to, to pay your bill and for you to take care of your family, make that happen on your own. And so that was always planted in me. Like, yes, I can go work for someone else or I can build something that is, um, helping myself take care of my family, but also creates a lot of opportunities for others. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, because I had that mentality, it really helped me to, to see how to do that and also continue to do that and see my, my father resiliency over time, continue to do that. Um, really is inspiring and, and uh, what they had to go through to get to where they were and finally raise me the way I am right now. I think it's, it's, it's just incredible um, and a testament to really their abilities to, to start over from scratch, you know, bare hands with nothing in, in their pockets coming here in 1978. Wow. Well, they, I'm, I'm sure your dad is so proud of you and all that you accomplished because I find your story very, very inspiring. And it's now it makes a lot of sense, Jack. I mean, what you, you went through and your parents experienced, but I love that. I love that lesson of like that being resilient and like, you know, depending on yourself. And actually let's talk about that because you have built quite um, some companies and you've had successes that you shared it with us earlier, but talk about AirDeck and why AirDeck is important to you now. Yeah, so you know, Airdeck. Um, I met the founder of Airdeck, Jason Weaver, uh, about 10, 12 years ago after I sold my second company. And, um, you know, so he and I were talking, he was building a company at that time. And, uh, you know, he was having some difficulties in certain different areas. And just as a, you know, peer and mentor, uh, I kind of talked to him about what he was doing and getting over that hump. And then once you get over that hump, it really everything takes off. Um, and so he took that to heart. He went and grew his business, grew it to a really great um, large business in, in Madison. Uh, and then he ended up uh, selling that company and, and had a great exit from there. So we've stayed in touch since then. And and he's always throwing, you know, as entrepreneurs, we never stop. We always like, oh, what have we created this? What have we created that? And so he and I, we've always talked over the years. And uh, right before the pandemic, he was talking about a project that he was working on and he wanted to uh, bring, you know, narration to, you know, plain PDFs and, and documents. And um, so I, I followed him along while he kind of played around the idea. He shared it with social media, with friends, and then the pandemic hit. Um, and he was like, this is the time. This is when I need to make this available. So he went out and um, looked at his product and said, you know, the pandemic was forcing everyone in March of 2020 to go uh, remote, right? And so teachers mm -hmm. had to take their lectures offline or asynchronous type of communication. They couldn't bring students into classrooms anymore. And so Jason said, you know what? I'm gonna make this product available to all the schools for free. And so he went out and, and uh, gave all these schools, 800 schools, I believe at that time, 
access to Airdeck, which was, you know, take your lecture, take your lesson plan, put it into Airdeck, narrate it as if you're giving a plan to uh, to or a, a lesson to your class and and uh, send it out and your students can uh, watch the lesson they can interact with it uh, they can get the narration from you but then the, you're also tracking where they engage how often they engage in, in, uh, on the content and and how they are able to um, digest the information where they're spending time and so on and so forth so that was kind of the, the birth of air deck and since then we've taken that product and we've we've identified this more of a b2b product right and so mm -hmm. what we're seeing is uh companies who need to onboard uh, you know new customers hundreds of new customers or a, a bunch of new employees uh, and they're taking these attachments or or these uh, training documents or they're taking these uh, materials to help uh, people onboard um and rather than sending a, a, an attachment into a an email they would send a, you know um air decks right and so they could take mm -hmm. that attachment put it into our platform narrate it and then send a unique link so that you you know these uh the people receiving it on the other end are able to you know see a, a, a an actual uh air deck of the presentation of a document without having to spend time on a meeting so essentially what we we're doing is we were taking away meetings that weren't necessary anymore. How many times have you had to send out a document and you're mm -hmm. like, okay, here's the attachment. Here's all the, everything you need to do. You know what? Let's schedule a call so I can go over this with you right. because you're missing context, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so Air Deck really allows you to take any type of document or presentation, narrate it, add video overlay. And um, so when I, I heard about that, I, you know, Jason was talking about what was going on with Air Deck. I'm like, God, this is a game-changing technology, what, what you're doing, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, how many people send attachments and how many people are, are wish they could not spend time in a meeting going over that attachment and they can just send a narrated pitch deck or a narrated uh, demo or, uh, or or training document and lo and behold air deck has just been growing significantly and i've been i've gone on board to to really help shape the uh, marketing of air deck as well as to help people become aware of what air deck is and, and how it really can change the way that we're communicating yeah, I think it's so smart, Jack. I mean, it helps give context. And so many times we say things are lost in translation, right? You might get an email or a text and it doesn't have that warm, fun, fuzzy or the tone that you want. This sort of um, resolves that. And also what I like about it is it helps uh, definitely uh, us to be more productive and it stretches our time schedule every day, right? So that we don't have to, you know, be jumping Zoom to Zoom. We can actually send this document and it can do a lot of the initial heavy lifting. But, you know, I got to talk, we got to talk about your, you have so many organizations, but this one I love as well. So great job on Air Duck, but let's, you know, sort of segue over to, you know, the Charity Care Act. I would love for you to talk about that because I know you're involved with Dollar Four, which let's be honest, it's helping millions of families. And we need to talk about this and get the word out on this. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I met the dollar four folks um, several years ago. And, and, you know, they were it was it was a guy named Jared Walker, and he was helping out, um, you know, uh, some family members uh, with medical debt. And he found out that you can go to the hospitals. And if you, you know, dig into the websites, and you can find out um, if they have a charity care act, and the people qualify their nonprofit hospital, and based on their income levels, but well, you can request to have your um, debt completely paid off. So he did that successfully. And then he's like, Oh, this medical debt that my family ha had, um, I just actually helped them eliminate that completely. He's like, how many other families out there are having these issues. Um, and so he went on to do a little more research and he, he met an attorney friend who helped look at all the legal side of it and realized um, that there's a, is a much bigger problem um, that is out there. And medical debt, you know, um, obviously, as you know, is one of the leading causes of bankruptcies um, and, and debt in the, in the U.S. I think there's some ridiculous number as far as how much medical debt there is in the U.S. Uh, and amazingly, most of that debt can and should be cleared completely, right? And that's because of the Charity Care Act. And the Charity Care Act basically says that if you're a nonprofit hospital, you're required to write off uh, or you know forgive debt if people fall within the income requirements. And it's by state uh, and, and and national and by areas as well. But every hospital, we've now gone through and cataloged every single hospital in the U.S. that is a nonprofit hospital, and we put it into our website, into our 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 um, application and you can go there to dollar fort right now and you can go in there and and you know get help with your medical debt if you uh put in your information you search for the the hospital that that you're 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 there um and you can put in your information they can quickly identify with based on your income level uh, and whatnot 
how you know if that hospital should be forgiving your debt and you'd be surprised because uh you would think that okay you have um you know a, a lot of debt but your the family makes too much money right mm -hmm. um the debt requirements is actually uh, very interesting you can still um make money but if you have like a family of of you know three kids or four kids and a husband and wife, you'd be surprised what that threshold is. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's you can make over hundred K and still have that debt, um, you know, relieved. So, um, there's a lot of things, what Eric, what double, sorry, what double, what dollar four has been doing has really to help, uh, patients. Cause there's so, so much of that information that if every single person tried to do this on their own, um, you could do it. But what we try to do is as a nonprofit, have volunteers and resources that can help you um, navigate that so that uh, the hospitals can, we'll reach out to hospitals, uh, write letters, uh, follow the process, follow up. And then at the end of the day, people get the letter, say your debt has been forgiving, forgiven. And there's great stories we have on, on, on the website too, where um, there's a family who, um, you know, a father got into a car accident and he, uh, you know, his, what he was the single income person and it stopped working a uh, hundred and some odd thousand dollars in like 135,000, I believe was the total. And they thought that was it. They, they were done. They had to either file bankruptcy or figure something out. He was unable to work. She had to find a new job. Uh, and then they found dollar four. And what happened was, you know, in, in his road to recovery, we helped him look at that debt, analyze what the family situation was, um, get the information to the hospital, made a case for why this debt should be relieved. And a couple of weeks later, the hospital wrote back and said the $135,000 in debt completely wiped away. So. Jack, that's just incredible. And I think, you know, so many families, you know, medical debt is such a such a big one because let's be honest, most of us don't expect to get sick. We don't expect to be hurt. And we certainly feel like, well, that's why we have medical insurance only to find out oftentimes, number one, you may find that you're underinsured or maybe you don't have insurance and uh, the number is just so big, you don't even know where to start because always that sort of surprise of how expensive proper hospital care can be. So when I actually learned um, from you, Jack, about the Charity Care Act, I thought this was incredible. So this is really good. I think especially timely that we're, we just talked about earlier, we're still going through COVID, right? A lot of people still getting sick. This is something that is important. You may not need this right now, but it's good information to have. And so, so Jack, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And, you know, this is why you're, you're, Everyone who's watching, listening today, this is why you're really going to want to, you know, follow Jack on Twitter and everything else, because not only, as you can tell, he's now involved in helping businesses communicate more effi efficiently, more effectively, right, through AirDeck. And then he now has taught us also about um, medical debt. And for some of our loved ones and friends and family, they might actually really benefit from the knowledge that um, he shared on the show today. But let's talk about something fun, Jack. Let's talk about your just incredible K-pop journey. Now, I teased it at the beginning of the show. Some of you are probably like, what are you talking about? I got to take a moment and just say, it is awesome to have you here. Joshua cross -X Fighter is, he actually really enjoyed the, the bit about being caught by pirates, but I just want you to know, Jack, he really enjoyed that. <laughs> Vicky is joining us from the UK. It's so great to see you as well. I see well, a, lot, a lot of you joining us. Thank you so much. Definitely you know, let us know where you're joining us from and any questions that you might have for Jack. But Jack, we got to talk about this because... You know, I know you as a super entrepreneur, very, very smart business person from the technology, marketing, you know, everything. But then K-pop, Jack, sometimes, <laughs> you you know, you got to share with us, how did this happen? Are you like, uh, you know, you, you dance K-pop and sing the K-pop in the evenings and we don't know about this? Where did this come from? <laughs> That's a... It's 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 a, it's really an incredible story, incredible journey for me. That uh, I, I love telling the story just because of, you know, how far it's it's taken me and the people I've met and the relationships I have now uh, in the with the K-pop community um, uh, as a whole. But um, you know, I've, I've always been into music. I love music from all genres, right? And I actually, my roommate in college was uh, Korean, and so we I listened to you know the early days, first gen K-pop, right? And, that, and a lot of that days was you know, uh, you know, early you know hip hop and and and, and music. But Korea, I'm not sure the whole story of K-pop, but back in the day, they went um, and said, you know, our export from Korea 
uh, is going to be entertainment uh, and uh, and and music and food, right? Um, which is fascinating. You think about where the world is today with K dramas, K pop music, and and you know dining and Korean barbecue, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you know, but really, so the, I, my first taste of you know kind of Korean pop culture has always been there. But I've always been a you know a, an international person. I, I studied abroad in China. I, I spent time in Japan and, and my roommates, and, and I hung out with all different cultures, but. I had, was not prepared for what happened to me in April, uh, in September of 2019, and really in 2019, uh, I was just a tech uh, entrepreneur, always looking at the latest things. And, and Apple uh, was releasing, I think, the iPhone 11 at that time. Wow. And so uh, I'm watching the Apple event. I log in like I do every year during the Apple events for the latest iPhones. Um, and I'm on Twitter and I'm looking at uh, the, the what's trending, and, and I'm like. Okay, we're 15 minutes into this. I know that in Asia, different things trend, but when the Apple event happens, mm -hmm. that's the number one trending thing. But for this day, I was looking at it, I'm like, something is still trending ahead of the Apple event. And it was just fascinating. I'm like, what, what is this? And so I looked at it, and it's just, you know, four letters, M-O-M-O, -M -O, Momo. And I'm like, mm -hmm. what is Momo? So that is literally <laughs> the tweet I, I tweeted out, which is Apple events happening now, um, you know, and Momo is trending ahead of what is Momo was just a simple question. Mm -hmm. And those, those, those few words of a question uh, just launched into uh, this fan base of, of twice, um, which is a K-pop group. And they started tweeting at me and, and telling me, Oh, the Momo is, is a member of the K-pop girl group twice. And uh, they have a, a new teaser that just dropped today. And, and everyone is, is, uh, going crazy because we're seeing Momo's forehead for the first time in four <laughs> years, and you know, try to take in, try to take trying to take that in. All of a sudden, was like, wait, what? What is all this? <laughs> um, but it was the um, the way that they responded to me was just fascinating, and my curiosity uh, was really piqued. And so the Apple event's still going on, but in the meantime, I'm I'm getting tweets from people. You need to watch this video. You need to check out twice. Learn about uh, the girls here. Learn about this. Learn about that. And you know, and I, you know what? I said, you know, I will. So I started to learn about them, and I started to react and, and engage. And and next thing you know, I'm like, God, this fan base is incredible. This fan base for mm -hmm. Twice, um, they're known as Once. The group's Twice. The fan base is known as Once. Was just incredible and very positive. Very, um, you know, wanting me, this tech entrepreneur, to to know about Twice, right? Lo and mm -hmm. behold, the so that was just day one, right? Uh, I'm like, <laughs> hey, this is pretty interesting, you know. Okay, getting a lot of likes and and retweets and 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 tweets at me and messages. I'm like, okay, great, that's fine. Next day was when everything kind of blew up for me the second time, right? So the next day, <laughs> I had no idea how much impact that my tweet would have had on this group. And so there's uh, news articles that was coming out um, in uh, South Korea and all over the world that basically had said iPhone 11 launches uh, during the Apple event, um, uh, trends a, mo, uh, twice trends ahead of it, startles CEO, right? And there's a picture <laughs> of Momo and a picture of me side by side. And uh, so a couple of things happened. One, uh, internationally, I'm surprised how many people didn't know this, but there were a lot of people who did not know who the CEO of Apple was. <laughs> and so <laughs> that, that headline of iPhone 11 launches, twice tr uh, Momo trends ahead of it, startles CEO, um, they were thinking the CEO of Apple, which I, they thought I was CEO of Apple, and it was started by that. <laughs> um, so it, it started a whole flood of, and I had to explain, no, I'm not the CEO. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I have a CEO, a, a company that I'm a CEO of and, and whatnot. Um, and so I, I, I kind of played along with it, and, and I'm like, yeah, I mean, her music is, their, their music is awesome. I picked up, and I started tweeting about some of the things that were going on, and it was just crazy for about a week um you know news outlets all over the world is picking this up of you know some tech entrepreneur ceo is now talking you know with a million followers because i had a million followers already at that time was mm -hmm. talking about um you know twice this this k-pop girl group right mm -hmm. um but it was just it was amazing I, I really enjoyed that because it allowed me to kind of open up um uh, you know, my eyes to see these 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 kids and and not just all kids. There's a lot of adults uh, that follow K-pop, but it was the 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 positiveness that came from them because of their desire to want me to understand about uh, Twice and, and then their favorite um, you know group and and the songs that, that that inspire them and people who would cry because you know they they got to do certain things or you know someone wow. paid you know um, spoke to them about about Twice or Twice was able to do a video call with them. 
I was fascinated. Mm-hmm. Like, I think everyone should become a K-pop fan at some point in their lives just to experience this. And then slowly I started to experience this, which was fascinating. I got invited to a concert in, in, in uh, Korea during their um, a month after that it happened and experienced twice for the first time. And I didn't realize how big news it was um, until I got to Korea. You know, even then I was like, okay, it, it's big on internet but people wouldn't really know who i was but i got to korea mm-hmm. people recognized me right away they're like you're a ceo guy can i take a picture you're the ceo guy and i'm like wow <laughs> lo and behold because twice is is the biggest girl group uh, in k-pop right and so um i i did, had no idea i mean it's they're like the the, the girl version of uh, bts right so um it's just, it's just been phenomenal an incredible ride i even did a, a um uh, a a talk for um adobe's uh, emerging um uh tech talk and, and i talked about how building a fan base for your company uh is also as important and if here's some tips from k-pop that you can learn to grow your audience and it's, it's just an incredible really incredible journey and, and i apologize for really talking too much around this but it, it's really something i've really enjoyed no jack you know you 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 tease it so i'm going to ask you give me one of those tips that you shared at your adobe talk what can we learn what should business be thinking of yeah, no, absolutely. And, and so, you know, when you're with, with K-pop, what I found out real quickly is when you have a fan base um, or you're, you you build a fans for your music or whatever it is, fans will do anything for you, right? Uh, it, mm-hmm. it's, I mean, quite literally, there are some who will literally do anything, right? But you think about sports teams or movie franchises or, or franchises or whatnot, but K-pop takes it to a whole new level. Um, you know, people will spend money they don't have. They will, uh, you know, market you in ways that that is really authentic and through their eyes and through their lenses. Um, and really, so one of the things I, I talked about is in K-pop, they're constantly feeding you content, right? And so the the, the the companies will constantly feed their fan base content. What the fans do is they take that content and repurpose it, and and they'll push it back out, and and they'll do things. Um, so the more you give to your customers, your clients, or turn them into fans of your business, right? How you treat them, how they feel when you're, um, uh, what, how they feel when you know they're, they're they're your customer, and how you make them feel, they will do that in return to you. They'll give you good reviews. They'll talk about your company authentically. You don't have, you know, it, it's the fan base will do some amazing things. These concerts, these votings that happen, um, you know, the fact that BTS, you know, gets voted in, into a lot of these fans and, and, and then eventually Grammys, right, came mm-hmm. from the fans. All these things have to happen because of the fans, right? The, mm-hmm. the groups themselves can only go so far, but as well as, as, as much as the group can go and with their music and whatnot, it's how strong is that fan base? And if the fan base is that strong, they can push things uh, above and beyond and, and uh, you know, where people um, can't imagine. So it, it's with businesses it's the same way. Uh, I think, I believe that if you build a, a, a solid, you know, a fan base, you know, Apple fans or, um, you know, Samsung fans or whatever those type of fans are, Mm-hmm. They will be, you know, um, do things for the, those brands and they will talk about, it. they will defend you. They will def- do all these amazing things. And so that's part of my, you know, what I talked about is make sure you build a fan base, feed them as much information as possible and treat them in a way that, that they will uh, continue to, to praise your, you know, praise you, you, the work that you do and, and, and allow you to, um, you know, get free marketing basically out of that. I love it. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jack, for sharing that. Such an incredible journey and such a fun story. And, you know, I am definitely seeing so many positive comments. I'm sure you're seeing them, Jack, as well. So thank you, everyone, for being here. I think it's time for Joshua's favorite segment, and that is Speed Round. Speed Round. Jack, so grateful that you are here with us. I've learned so much. And honestly, I could go on for hours with you because I've enjoyed this conversation so much. But let's do this. We're going to give you two questions in two minutes. And so, Jack, I want to start with this question. You know, obviously, we learned of so much of your successes, you know, in this this brief time that we've had together. And a lot of people, I think, are in awe. We definitely, I think you have a lot of new fans today. But one thing I'd like to ask is this, you know, I think so often we learn from our disappointments. And I think we would agree that all of us have had them, especially in our, in our business journey. When you think about that, what do you think has been your biggest or greatest professional disappointment? And what, Jack, did you learn from that experience? Yeah, 
You know, that's a great question. You know, I talk a lot about my first startup and how we went out and raised $26 million and, and grew that company and, and sold it to, you know, another company called Service Magic at the time that eventually became Home Advisor. I think the one area that, that people don't realize is part of that story is um, the disappointment I had there is we raised money and brought in, um, you know, people that we thought knew more than us um, or not, not, not that actually not knew more than us. They, we brought in people that would tell us what to do um, thinking that they had all the right answers. Um, you know, I, I was a young entrepreneur at that time. I was in my early twenties. So one of my things is, okay, well, we raised the money and they're telling us this is what we need to do. Um, you know, that we'll do what they do. So we brought in, you know, millions of dollars of technology, brought in different uh, things to help grow the company and, uh, you know, raising that capital and diluting our, our equity to the point where, you know, by the time it was sold, there was not much left for us, right? Um, and I think it was the wrong reason to to raise money at that time, just simply because um, money was being thrown around uh, so much. I mean, you could throw a, uh, an idea on a paper napkin. I'm sure, you know, back in the 90s, people had ideas on napkins all the time that VCs would just throw money at. And then once the VCs throw money at you, you lose your equity, but then also you think you're on top of the world. But, you know, it, it was very, very challenging. Um, and so to, for me, it was like, trust the, the, your instincts, trust, uh, you know, what, what you're able to do. surround yourself with people who know more and can do more, uh, can add to, to that, but don't, you know, don't believe that just because someone says, here's a bunch of money that this is the right way to do it. That's always the right way. You have to use trust your intuition as an entrepreneur. Um, and you have to raise money for the right reasons. You have to make sure you have, the, you know, raising money with the right partners that can help you grow your business as opposed to someone who's looking to get rich off of your business. Right. Um, so that was one of the challenges I had early on in my career. And, and really I didn't make that mistake again. Um, in the second business, we kind of just bootstrapped that and didn't raise any money. We had offers, but we said, no, we're going to grow this ourselves, make the money uh, over time and and really uh, grow it ourselves. And, you know, I, I got a really nice exit from that company, which would have had to be in the hundreds of millions of dollars to get the exit I did if I had brought on investors. So uh, first business, um, that was kind of the disappointment that, that I had to deal with um, early on with, with raising capital and, and uh, um, you know, under learning really early on in my life that that it's not always easy just to take a bunch of money from people um it becomes their their business it becomes what they want to do and sometimes that's not always the best uh solution i love that i love that i love that i think i think a lot of entrepreneurs are listening and hearing this you know you gotta trust your intuition and right no such thing as a free lunch right jack so i love that all right this is the second question now i do believe and i know you believe as well that everybody has their own yes factor right there's something special about you what jack do you say that yours is that's a great question a superpower um so you know for me i think um you know i have a unique ability to just be able to look at things and always think that there's something possible right i remember early one of my my there's all nothing is impossible it's one of those things where i think uh, nelson mandela had a quote it's always feels impossible until it's done right um and you, a lot of us feel that way right you're like oh this is impossible and then when you you're, you finally get it done you're like oh that wasn't so bad after all right uh and so that i've always taken that perspective when people said um you know how are you going to uh, to do something or come up with, you know, replace yellow pages. Yellow pages have been around forever. All the contractors are, are, are putting money uh, into those advertisements, you know, yard signs on the, on the road, the internet, you know, um, how's that going to happen? Right. And mm -hmm. so these are things that for me, I was like, well, we'll figure out a way, right. It's almost like the Elon Musk strat, you know, uh, kind of way of thinking too, which I love the way he thinks, right. He's like, I'm going to build rockets. I'm going to take everybody, you know, uh, you know, Inter, we'll make uh, humans interplanetary and go to Mars one day, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's that type of vision that says, you know, it may seem impossible, right? It may be challenging, but a lot of people are like, well, you know, it's 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 going to be hard, right? Or, you know, that's never going to happen. It's impossible. Uh, I always think of it as, okay, let's find new ways of doing old things. Let's find, you know, the ways to achieve things and, and make the impossible possible, right? Um, and so it, it's, it's, to me, it's not really a superpower necessarily of, of being able to do that, but I, I maybe, you know, call me a person with rosy glasses all the time or something, but <laughs> I, I do look at things and, you know, I'm like, there's got to be a solution. There's got always has to be a solution to that problem, right? And, and maybe a solution you don't like, or maybe a solution that that really is is an opportunity, but I can never look at a problem and say there's no solution to it because I always think that there's a way to solve pretty much anything uh, if you put your mind to it. 
There's always a way to solve anything if you put your mind to a powerful jack. I love it. Thank you so much. Is there anything else that I should have asked you that I didn't that you want to share with us today? Um, I mean, you know, really right now, my, my uh, career has just been really on building on uh, different new businesses and, and startup ideas, you know, engaging with fans. Uh, I think there's uh, there's a uh, so twice had their concert uh, back in February mm-hmm. here in the U.S. tour. Uh, they're coming back this Saturday. So I'll be heading there down to L.A. again to to uh, head, head to that venue and, and an encore uh, concert, uh, which would be amazing at the Bank of America Center down there. Um, but, yeah, no, I mean, really. I encourage people to reach out to me. Uh, I've I've talked to people. I've mentored uh, others. You know, I tell I have a story I want to tell real quickly. Um, you know, during this whole K-pop frenzy um, that was happening, I met a lot of young people um, on through Twitter and people who DM me, and um, it, it's incredible the mental health of, of some of these kids. Right when they, I can make someone's day. It's really incredible that, I, that someone messages me and not expecting me to respond, and I respond. Uh, but there's been stories of people who would message me having a bad day, uh, kids, 14, 15 year, years old, not knowing how to tell their parents this and not knowing how to parents that. Um, there were some that have had uh, suicidal thoughts even, um, and they wanted someone just to talk to, right? Um, do what you can. Like every little piece that you can do um, can save people's lives. I had a, a friend, uh, a person now who's now a friend of mine on, on Twitter. She went through a really a tough, tough time. Um, and little things that you can do to make someone else's um, day can go a long ways. And I really encourage that to, to everyone, right? If, if, if you're going to do anything in your life, make sure that you can do just a little thing every day uh, that really helps um, other people. And, and there's been incredible things that, that I look at. I've had challenges in my life. I've had a lot of different things and I've always found things to, to do, right? Dollar four came out of that because I was like, okay, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm having some, some obstacles, some bottlenecks right now. Let's focus on helping other people doing other things for a while until I kind of get things sorted out. And it's really helped me and, and, and my career as a whole has been built around, you know, doing what I can do, but also helping out others uh, as you can. So Amazing. Amazing, Jack. So many people, I'm sure, can relate to that. And we are so grateful that you always continue to ask, why not me? You know, what else can I do and how can I make someone say just a little bit better? And I'm sure even those like what you describe as kids, um, they see you as, you know, someone of leadership. And that's why it's such a privilege for us to share your story during this month. So Jack, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate your forthcoming and your generosity and just being like, just, just your curiosity. It's so fascinating. And like Jack, keep on dreaming because we're going to keep on following you close along as well. Thank you so much, my friends, for watching and supporting our program today. And please take a moment to share the show just like Vicky does, I know, and Joshua do. Thank you so much for our friends for being here. And as a reminder, you're going to be able to find full episodes of Level Up with Winnie Sun on NASDAQ, KBCW, Amazon Fire, Roku, I think many, many other places uh, as well this week. And we're excited to, of course, share that Yes Factor, our brand new podcast, is now available on most podcast platforms. It's a LinkedIn Presents podcast. We're very excited and very proud to share it with all of you. Be well, and I can't wait to see you again tomorrow. All right, take care. See you soon. Bye-bye now.